Thank you, Ashkan. You've probably all heard that after you eat, you shouldn't go swimming for an hour or indulge in any kind of strenuous exercise. That's because after you eat, uh, your blood tends to be redirected towards the digestive system rather than your cardiovascular system, and you may have a heart attack. Well, the same thing goes because the blood goes to the digestive system, it doesn't go into the brain. So if you'd like to close your eyes, lean back comfortably, and try not to snore, we can go ahead. <clears throat> this is how all academics start their slideshow. Um, made up title, <laughs> made up institution, there's no such place really. Um, <laughs> And uh, misspelled flotation because it's not spelled F-L-O-A-T, it's F-L-O-T-A-T-I-O-N, which... Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm leaving. I don't have to put up with booing. Okay, anyway. <laughs> so, I'm, be I'm going to be talking about what we know about the effects of rest, flotation, and otherwise on creativity. So what do we know about the effects of rest in general? I, as you know, I don't read my slides. You can read faster than I can talk anyway. But those are effects that have been replicated by more than one study with reasonable size samples, with reasonable controls, and with reasonable measures. So they're not just anecdotal. Uh, they're not just the impressions that people get from speaking with uh, people who have floated and so on. These are hard data, okay? What you'll notice there is that it doesn't say anything about creativity. Now, if we go to what I called anecdotal results, that is, what do people tell us when they come out of the tank then you get lots of stuff about create, creative or pseudo-creative experiences, like vivid dreams and imagery. Well, they're not really creative in the sense that people consciously or deliberately create them, but they are different. And um, so, you know, there's, that's what I mean by pseudo-creative. Um, there's deep introspection. Um, contrary to what you have heard earlier uh, about um, the effects of rest on memory and on, on the quality of what you remember, uh, we have found that people remember pleasant occasions, pleasant experiences more often than, than unpleasant ones. So that's kind of nice. And then there's some changes in values, like uh, universalism, which is one of uh, 11 values measured by Shalom Schwartz's uh, universal value scale, and it tends to go up at least temporarily after floating. And some people actually achieve a meditative or self-hypnotic state. Uh, we once floated a Zen master uh, who wanted to see what it was like, and he came out after about 45 minutes when it ended, and he said that all his adult life he had meditated four or five hours a day, and during the course of a year of doing that, he reached a state of meditation that was about as deep as he had achieved in 45 minutes in the tank. I always wanted to follow that up and get some measures and get some more, uh, more um, practitioners of meditative techniques, but we never got around to it. So if anybody would like to try that, I'd be really interested in the results. Now, there have been studies purporting to measure the effects of rest on creativity but there is a definitional problem. If you try to measure creativity in a way that is quantitative, measurable, and so on, you, know, you can do statistical analysis on it, et cetera, you have a problem in identifying assessment techniques. And so what people usually do if they try to measure the effects of rest on creativity is to use a variety of psychological tests, psychometric instruments that are designed to do that. Uh, the Guilford test, for example, is a test for uh, unusual uses. So you'd give the person who's being tested um, a stimulus 
for example, a hammer. Uh, think up as many unusual uses for a hammer as you can in a given period of time. Okay? And then the more unusual uses you come up with, the more creative your, your score is. Okay? Uh, there are other things like uh, making up a new way of solving a problem um, or telling a story based on a stimulus uh, that the experimenter gives you, either orally, verbally, or a picture, and then some, somebody rates how original that is and so on. But uh, I have a problem with that because I think that originality and creativity are not the same thing. Original just means it's, as in the unusual, test, unusual uses test, that it's unusual. Okay? If you tell somebody make up uses for a hammer, they can say, you know, you hit a nail, uh, you break open a jar that you can't open any other way, and so on. Those are not original, but you can say you can use it as a pendulum on a clock. That's unusual. It's not very creative because it's not very useful. And creativity, I think, has to involve something that is both original, that is not your standard response, but that also has some kind of value to it. Uh, that is, it, a new way of actually solving a problem that's uh, important or at least meaningful. Um, as, I, as I said on the slide there, that represents new and improved uh, ways of looking at a topic and it can be improved you know, in many different ways. It can be prettier, more beautiful. It can be more fitting. Uh, it can be morally superior to the normal solutions. It can be more useful in the real world and so on. And so for something to be actually creative, you need more than for it just to be unusual. So, you know, a beautiful painting, a musical composition, a new scientific theory, a new political system, and so on, would qualify, uh, in my definition, as creative if they are also original. If they are only original, then that doesn't uh, uh, meet the standards. So, what do we, what do we know about rest? Well, <clears throat> there have been, I think, a couple of studies of so-called creativity, actually originality, uh, in flotation. And um, one is quite old. Um, four gaze and four gaze was over 50 years ago. Uh, and there's also a newer one um, that was, that's about 10 years old. And they both found some improvement in performance on these tests of originality. Okay. That looked like uh, a, a beneficial effect of floating. I did a couple myself of these experiments. I'm not citing myself, but um, we found pretty much the same thing. We found story, we, we use a storytelling task. Storytelling, I'll give you an example. Uh, there is a person standing in a phone booth. Do you remember phone booths? Probably not. <laughs> I do. Anyway, uh, there's, a, there's a person standing in a phone booth um, with the phone in his hand, and there's somebody standing outside hammering on the door. Make up a story. Okay? Now, people can make up lots of stories. Some of them are pretty obvious. Some of them are not so obvious. But the question is, how do you score that? And what, what we did was develop the scoring system, for example, to what extent uh, did the story include why the people were doing this, who they were, what they were trying to accomplish, um, and, and how would it turn out? And we had rating scales, and we had people uh, who used the rating scales to, to judge the stories. And in fact, it turned out that people in uh, REST did more creative stories than, than a control group. Okay? But then when I thought back on it, is, is this creative? Well, you know, it's kind of betwixt and between. Uh, depending on how good the story is, how interesting it is, it might be creative. But if it's just a story that's, that's off the norm, that may or may not meet the, my more stringent uh, criteria for creativity. 
So basically, um, as you've heard me talk before, what I have to say is, what are the effects of flotation on creativity? We don't really know. So we've got, we've got clues, we've got some kind of related data, but we don't really have the data to answer that question. After that, I did a couple of studies, uh, one of which was um, kind of surprised my department at uh, the University of British Columbia. I asked some of my colleagues in the psychology department to float and talk into a microphone about ideas uh, about their research when they came out, or sit in their office for an hour and record ideas about their research. And then we came back six months later, by which time they'd forgotten what was what, and we had their story, their uh, ideas all mixed up, so they couldn't tell which was in the, in the tank and which was in the office, and we had them rate how creative those ideas were, okay? And now, we use the definition of creativity that was both original and important, or in some way really contributed, uh, either to your research program or to your theoretical ideas. And um, it turned out that they rated the ideas that they'd come up with after floating as more creative than the ideas that they'd come up from after being in the office. So that was a clue. What was the problem with it? Well, the problem, one of the problems with it is that it was self-ratings. And, you know, you can always think, well, maybe they did remember which one was which, where they, where they generated the idea, and so on. So we should have given it to outside observers and asked them to rate it, but we didn't do that. The second study, which came out about five years ago, was on music students who were given a task of performing an improvised piece for their professor, their, their jazz professor, so somebody who's an expert in the field. And we asked the professor to rate various aspects of the performance, and this was either, before, either after floating or, or not. And what we found was that, that rating music is more complicated than perhaps we had realized because the professors rated some things as more creative, some aspects of the music as more creative, but other aspects as not. So we had mixed results. You know, that's why I said before, we still don't know the answer to the original question. Now there's another question that intrigues me, and that is, to what extent, if there is an effect a result that supports the hypothesis that uh, floating imp improves creative performance of some sort. To what extent is that really due to floating? To what extent is it due to stimulus reduction? Okay. Yeah, floating is a multidimensional experience. Stimulus reduction is part of that. It's, it's one of the dimensions of the multidimensional experience. Obviously, it's not the only dimension. So can we say, um, the reduction of uh, feeling of gravity uh, increases your ability to, to create new ideas. Um, is it uh, lying supine in an Epsom salt solution? Is it the silence? What is it? And so I looked at, uh, as I like to do, at historical analogs. Other environments in which stimulus reduction occurred, but not in the context of a flotation tank. And there is a list of some of the environments that I looked at and found all kinds of creative events, I guess, um, in, uh, in many of those. For example, if you look at the originators of the major world religions, every one of them, of the major world religions, obviously a lot of minor ones, in terms of the number of people who adhere to them and in terms of their influence on the world, Every one of them generated his basic ideas in solitude, in an environment that, in which they were not only alone, but they were in a situation of reduced stimulation, in a desert, on a mountain, in a forest, under a tree, in a cave, and so on. So those ideas were creative. They were both original and they were very influential. They changed the lives of millions of people in some cases almost all of those cases. So in that, in that um, 
conclusion would be that it's a stimulus reduction that can have a creative effect. And if you look at some of these other examples, uh, there, there are many uh, similar findings. And the third person phenomenon, I don't know if you're familiar with it, uh, it's a finding of people who are in, uh, again, reduced, envir envir redu reduced environmental stimulation situations, uh, but usually in trouble of some sort. Uh, mountain climbers, um, shipwrecked sailors, people like that. And they imagine a third person being there who helps them survive. Now, you could say it's a hallucination, but it helps them survive. It tells them, for example, if they're lost, it tells them in which direction to go. Uh, the most famous example is that of Joshua Slocum, the first man to sail around the world single-handed. He was in his little boat off the Azores. He got sick, probably from food poisoning, and uh, there, was a, there was a big storm coming, and if he couldn't steer the boat into the, into the wind, it would capsize, and he would drown. And he woke up, and there was a man steering the boat. Um, and he was steering it properly in, into the wind. And um, Slocum was very scared, and the man said, don't be scared. I'll steer your boat so you'll be safe. And I'm the pilot of one of Columbus's ships. Okay? Now, I mean, we can take that at face value. Maybe it was, right? But maybe it wasn't. And so what was it if it wasn't true, if it wasn't the real thing? Nobody knows, of course. And many, many examples of that. There is a book called The uh, Third Man Phenomenon um, that you might want to look at if this interests you. Okay. Uh, now, the, um, the autobiographies and biographies of people who are accepted by the world as being highly creative, I have a long, long list here. I'll give you some examples. This, these are from some of my uh, historical work and some from a book by a, a British psychiatrist named Anthony Storrs. Um, so here are some examples. Mozart, Picasso, Kafka, Sandberg, Einstein, Tesla, uh, Descartes, Emily Dickinson, uh, Virginia Woolf, and there are many others. And there's, there's also... Um, Raymond Cattell, I didn't want to leave out the psychologists, uh, but all of these in their autobiographies testified that they did their best creative work, and in some cases they could only do creative work if they were alone in a quiet environment, low stimulation, some of them in darkness or semi-darkness, and so on. So, to what extent does uh, flotation or rest in general Facilitate creative activity, creative accomplishments, and so on. What can I tell you? I, said, I told you before, we don't know. But it looks like uh, stimulus reduction can, in fact, uh, contribute to that kind of behavior. And presumably, then, flotation can as well. And because flotation gives you more profound stimulus reduction than most other environments, maybe it can help more than other environments. There's a book here, I don't know if you've, any of you have seen it, it's called Artwork from the Void, okay, from uh, Float On, of which you've probably heard, uh, edited by uh, Ashkan, of whom you've also probably heard, uh, which has a whole lot of examples of artwork and some essays and poetry and so on uh, that people produced when they came out of the tank. And it's, some of it is fairly standard, uh, not Ter terribly unusual, but some of it is really creative, I think, in, in artistic terms. So, again, it's anecdotal, and as we know, anecdotes are not data, but they can point the way to things about which data could be collected. So go out there and collect it. Thank you.